All right. Take your Bibles and turn to First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter one. And uh, we're going to continue in verse 3. 1 Corinthians 1 3. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started this morning. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the services. I pray that you'll bless them. I pray that you'll bless those that came out. I pray that you'll give them something and strengthen them in your word. Strengthen them in your heart. I pray that as we come into these latter days and these latter times that we will be strong in our faith and have a desire to serve you and not be distracted with those things around us. And I pray that we'll continue to stay focused on serving you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, verse 4, I mean verse 3. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Colossians 2.9 is a reference you want here showing that Christ is deity in the Trinity, that He was the Godhead bodily. Okay, Some, some people try to use verse 3 to prove that the deity of uh, that the Trinity is not correct, that God the Father and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ are different. To me, actually, verse three proves they're the same, but the way people read it. So, take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter two, verse nine. Colossians chapter two, verse nine. It is surprising to me, I mean, ignorance is bliss sometimes. And uh, before I started dealing with some of the Bible pages on Facebook, I was ignorant of how people depart from the faith. And one of your main doctrines, one of the basic fundamentals of the faith, a doctrine that's been taught for years that one should never depart from is two things. Then they go hand in hand. The deity of Christ and the Trinity. Okay? Those are two main doctrines. And you have Bible believers departing from the doctrine of the Trinity today. And I mean, I can see them getting messed up here and there, but the Trinity... It's like, come on, of all things, where somebody can go sideways on, and all it is is some novice trying to overthink verses and getting himself all messed up. But uh, when one starts questioning the Trinity or questioning the deity of Christ, he's in a bad spot. He's in a really bad spot. Uh, so that's the reason I want to emphasize this verse a little bit. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Um, let's get verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain de- deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily. Now, uh, Jesus Christ was God manifested what? In the flesh. God became man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was... This way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was... Huh? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. All right. Trying to quote the verses here. I I should just turn and read it. But, uh, But... 
I mean, you can't mistake it. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And in Him dwelt the Godhead bodily. The Godhead, when you see that passage, that's referring to God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit. All three are the Godhead. It's a reference to all of them. Okay? That's a reference to the Trinity. The Trinity is an absolute biblical doctrine. And uh, don't, don't ever question the Trinity. You start questioning that the Trinity, and then uh, you're in a bad spot. The deity of Christ, what separates a true Christian and a true believer, is what he believes about Jesus Christ and His deity. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, I do not believe you're saved. Because you're trusting in another Jesus. You're trusting in a false Christ. I mean, there's many Jesuses out there. The Bible says that. There's only one true, and that was God in the flesh. I mean, there's reason we put our faith in Him. Okay? So, uh, that's the difference between the JWs and the Mormons and us. JWs and the Mormons don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That's why we consider them an occult. Now, we may have disagreements with the other denominations, but at least they got the Trinity and the deity of Christ right. Now, that's two major doctrines. You don't want to take and mess up on those two doctrines. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. Now God is your Father when you get saved, when you get born again. Until then, He is not your Father. Now look at Romans 8 and look when He becomes your Father. Look at Romans chapter 8. And uh, now this also is correcting another false doctrine out there where they say we are all the children of God. No, you're the children of Adam. And you been, when you sinned, you became a child of the devil. And when, you got, and when you got born again, then you became a child of God. Okay? Romans chapter 8. And look at verse... Um, we, we want Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17. Okay? So, uh, it says, For ye have... Not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay, He became your Father when you got saved. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, we may be also glorified. Now, uh, you, when does that happen? That happens when you're born again. Go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And that's why the reference is used that you are born again. Yeah. Look, it says, uh, let's go to um, verse 2. It says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus Christ quits dealing with the Pharisee on his philosophy and just goes straight to the point. He says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the spiritual kingdom. Okay. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the second time to his mother's womb and be born? 
Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water. If you've ever delivered a baby, you know what that being born of water is a physical birth. It's called her water breaking. Okay? Born of water and of the Spirit. First birth, second birth. Ye cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. First birth. That which is born of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, capital S, is Spirit. Marvel not, and I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So that is when you are born the second time into the family of God. Pharisees were told by Jesus Christ, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Okay? The devil is referred to the father of all the children of pride. Okay, so God is our Father. When when we get born again, okay. I know I know it's nice to say, well, we're all created by God. Okay, I understand the breath of God gives life. I understand God created man. And I understand that every breath that you take is a gift from God, and God gave that to you. I understand that. Uh, but I also understand spiritually when you sin, when, less, when lust was conceived, it brought forth death. And when that lust was conceived, you became the devil's child. And until you're born again, you are of your father, the devil. You say, I don't like my family. Well, get adopted into a new family. Get born again. I mean, amen. I want to like. I didn't. I, I don't think that's a good family either. You need to leave that family. Thank God that He adopted me. I'm a child of the King now. Now go back to First uh, Corinthians chapter uh, three. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Now what is grace? Grace is mercy given that's not deserved. And that's given by Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 is very clear. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, uh, the grace of God was given to us. All right? Salvation is a gift. And it's given by grace. For by grace are we saved. And, uh, and without grace, you'd, you'd been out. You'd have been out. The Lord shows grace. Thank God for His grace. I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul's telling his disciples, I, I thank God that you, the Lord gave you the grace allowed you to get saved. Now that was important because uh, with the Jews and the Gentiles, they, the Gentiles never received as much grace as what the Jews did. They weren't God's chosen people until after the cross. That, that cross showed a benefit to the Gentiles that they didn't have before. Now, I'm not saying they couldn't get saved, but they didn't have the chance that the Jews had. They, they, they weren't um, God's chosen people before. And now, I mean, your race doesn't matter. All that matters is whether or not you have received the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's thankful for his converts. Verse, first, first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. That in everything ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Enriched. Take your Bible and tur turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Enrich means to make one richer. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 11. It says, Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes us through us thanksgiving to God. Now that's quite a statement. It says we're enriched in all things unto all bountifulness. Now those that are carnal will say, well, we're enriched in all physical goods. That's the core of the prosperity gospel. That when you get saved, then God's going to enrich you in all aspects of life. And they focus on the carnal life. So, we need to understand how you become rich in Christ. Real riches are of God's riches. They're not of man's riches. Alright? You are rich. Now, in eternity, you're going to become physically rich. That's when the spirit and the physical becomes one. But, you became rich immediately when you got saved spiritually. Why? Because your soul is saved spiritually. You were born again spiritually. This flesh hasn't been redeemed yet. This flesh has not become rich yet. So you're going to want to separate standing and state here. Okay? Spiritually, I'm rich in Christ with spiritual goods. Physically, I'm waiting for the redemption of my body. Then I'll be walking around on gold like it's pavement. Because it will be. And I'll have a mansion in heaven. And all the pleasures that God has and all the riches of God will be there for me to enjoy. Right now, though, is the time of suffering. When Christ was a man, He came down and became flesh. And you know what His pillow was? It was a rock. He didn't even have shelter over His head. He slept out under the stars on using rocks for pillows. And He was trying to show you that on this earthly life, this physical life, that if we are supposed to follow His reproach, we will not be given by God all the riches of this world. And if we seek the riches of this world, we're trying to serve the flesh. We're not serving God. Okay? I'm not preaching against owning wealth here. I'm preaching against your focus. And it's kind of funny that as I'm studying James, we're going to get into this in James maybe today, probably next week, on the difference between the poor and the rich, and the emphasis on riches. But real riches of are God's riches. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 12. And uh, we're going to look at some passages on this. I want to give you some verses. And you want to get this down. Luke chapter 12, and pick up verse 21. Most people are focused on this physical line. Let's get the contents and go back up to uh, verse 15. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life, this physical life, consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's your physical goods. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater. Because a businessman is never satisfied. Business is never satisfied. The making of money, there is no end. If you ever work for your employee, he always wants to make you more productive. How often do you have an employer come to you as an employee and say, you know what, you're doing enough right where you're at. You don't need to do no more. That doesn't happen. (laughs) I mean, that's not the way they're wired. 
They always want more productivity. Okay? Pull down my barns and will be built greater. There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Okay? So you have a man that's rich on this earth, but that doesn't mean he's rich toward God. And uh, riches toward God is something else. Now, look at Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18. So there's a contrast between rich, being rich toward God and rich on this earth. I want to be rich toward God. Okay? Now, as far as being rich on this earth, man, I let that pipe dream go a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, in reality, though, compared to what they were in the times of the Bible, if they looked at what I have, I'd probably be considered rich. Man, I, I can, a lot of times... A third of my food goes to my dogs and my chickens. Why? Because they're leftovers. Or goes out in the trash. I don't even have to walk to work. I have this chariot that carries me. And blows cold air on my face or heat in my face when I want. You realize they never had that before? They had to walk to work in the blizzard or in the hot sun before. Only rich people had chariots pulled for them. You have a car, you're rich. Honestly, you're rich. I have a little Avio, it has no AC in it. But it does have heat. I live in Montana, I used to live in Florida. AC here, it's not a necessity. <laughs> We kind of think it is sometimes, but after you live in Florida and you come up here, yeah, it's, it's not really a necessity. It's a luxury, okay? Now look at a Proverbs chapter. So in reality, we as Americans, we're probably a lot more rich than we realize. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18, it says, Riches and honor are with me, Yea, durable riches and what? Righteousness. God's riches are durable. They're durable riches. They're something that will last. It's not like that rich man's riches that is gone. As soon as he dies, they're gone. Okay? Now, true riches is going to follow you after you die. That's real riches. That's God's riches. Okay? True riches start with Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 8. It says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable what? riches of Christ. You want true riches? you need to get Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your Savior is more valuable than this entire world. The Bible says, we just read it, for what shall profit a man, he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. There is nothing, if you had control over the entire world, you the richest man, most powerful man, and you could have anything in this world that you wanted. Without Christ, you're poorer than I am. Because I got Christ. I got Christ. Christ is more important than this entire world. That's riches beyond anything we can imagine. True riches start with Christ. Turn to Colossians. Now it's hard for us to think that way. It's hard to think that way. Because all we can see is the carnal, physical world. Look at Colossians chapter 1. 
Look at verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, now Christ, Christ is true riches. I'll tell you, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you just got something money couldn't buy. You got eternal life. They want to sell me health care. Well, they, they have sold me health care. But you know what I found with health care? It's a joke. <laughs> I mean, that's what I found with health care. They, they, oh, we'll cover this, this, and this until you take and really ask them, and then they ain't nothing but a big letdown. Now, I mean, all it is to me is another tax, another necessary tax. And uh, it, it wears me out. Just wears me out on that stuff. But uh, real, real riches is with Jesus Christ. It doesn't let you down. Amen. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And um, look at verse uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. There's nothing greater than the riches of God's grace. And that's not something you can earn. It's given to you. It's given to you. It's a free gift. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be, what? Rich. In other words, we get everything that Christ left. You know why He left? His eternal riches and glory became poor. So you can have the eternal riches and glory. I got a mansion waiting for me. And uh, uh, in a city where they pave the streets with gold. And there's pleasures forevermore. And there's no tears, no crying, no pain, and no sorrow. The perfect vacation that never ends. There's no night because we don't get tired. We just enjoy ourselves for eternity in God's presence. One of these days, I'm going to earn, be given the riches my heart desires. And it's not here. It's up there. But we do become rich spiritually. Now there's forms of God's riches that the believer has. First one we see was right here in 1 Corinthians 1.5. It says that in everything... Ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. You know, knowledge is a great rich. Uh, uh, you, you know how I know um, knowledge has great value for it? Because they sell it all the time. You don't believe me? See if your education's free. Free education. You say, well, it's free. There's no such thing as free on this earth. You're paying, somebody's paying for it. It's not free. If you think it's free, it's probably the lowest quality of education. But if you go and you get education, you know what they want? They want you to pay for their knowledge. Knowledge is not free. I used to people tell people in the automotive, well, well advice is free. Well, that's changed. Advice isn't free. Okay? I, I had a guy, he comes whipping up. I mean, this was actually either yesterday or Thursday morning. I was, uh, I'm pretty busy in the shop. 
I'm the only technician there right now. So I got two young guys that I'm trying to train underneath me. But that, that shop used to run about seven techs. I'm the only one there, so I'm quite busy. I'm sitting here working. It was a warm day. I threw up the bay doors. And this guy comes whipping in with an old Ford Mustang. He comes walking. You're the only one working here? I need somebody to ride with me. I said, you got to go talk to a service rider and get an RO written up. Otherwise, I can't take time off to go look at your car. I said, no. Why? Because advice no longer was free. I was too busy. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that, that's just the way it was. You, you know what people do? They sell knowledge. They sell knowledge. The Lord says, knowledge is the riches of Christ. Wisdom. God will give you knowledge and wisdom. And that's a true riches. Uh, and, and He'll give it to you. Knowledge is a great, uh, is great riches. Take your Bible and turn to uh, um, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 33. Romans 11, verse 33. I'll tell you, knowledge and wisdom, that's, I mean true wisdom, wisdom that comes from God, that's great riches. It's of a great value. It's great value. This world will charge you for knowledge. You, know, you go, you try to get an education, you have to pay for that education. Uh, I mean, uh, these kid, young people today, I feel sorry for them, they have to pay so much for their college education, that it takes them years of debt to pay it off. I mean, I was fortunate. I went to a trade school where I was able to pay it as I went through it. I didn't have no student debt. But man, student debt, that's a huge thing. And you know what they're doing? They're training them that they'll never live life without being in debt. I mean, that they hit them right from the start with that. And uh, I try to live life out of debt. Right, right now, I, I guess I owe about 300 to a tool truck. I could pay it off if I wanted to. And that's the only debt I have. I've been able to pay all my debts up to this point. Now, if I ever buy a house, I'll, I'll be in debt. But I mean, that's, I don't think I'm going to get away with paying cash for a house. At least not one that my wife would be satisfied living in. <laughs> that's, uh, I don't know, maybe she would be. Uh, cardboard sound good to you? or <laughs> Grass hut? I mean, which one do you want? <laughs> but, uh, but you get a... Uh, but um, but knowledge, knowledge does not come cheap. Look at Romans chapter 11. 11. Look at verse 33. Romans 11, 33. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments as ways past finding out? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been His counselor? And it says that the, the depths of riches there just to have the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God. You have some great riches in Christ. What, you, what do you have available you have the Holy Spirit that guides you into all truth and knowledge and wisdom. Uh, wisdom cries within the streets. The Lord wants to give you wisdom, give you some riches of knowledge. But it's real knowledge. It's spiritual knowledge. It's true knowledge. And it's not this fake stuff they charge you for in the colleges. Okay? It's, it's the real deal. It's the real deal. Real riches of Christ. I mean, we're talking about God's riches, and these are some real riches. And you say, I want the physical riches. Well, you need to wait till glory for that. All, all the stuff that you have here is a Chinese knockoff. And that's becoming more literal every day. <laughs> I mean, but uh, take your Bible and turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here's another spiritual riches that God gives you. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You want some real riches? Here's one. 
This is, this is money in the bank. Spiritual bank. We'll, we'll be talking about this in the sermon today some a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter... Uh, the First Timothy, we want chapter 6, verse 17 and 8. It says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in, here it is again, uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich, what? In good works ready to dis- distribute, willing to communicate. Why? Because that's money in the bank. Look at verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may hold on to eternal life. What's it talking about? It's talking about the things in eternal. Eternity. Now, it's not talking about salvation there. It's talking about your rewards of works in eternity. That's the judgment seat of Christ. You say, will the Christian be judged according to his works? Yes, he will. Not for salvation, but for your rewards of eternity. Your crown, your rewards. And it says, you will receive a reward if you're faithful. And uh, I mentioned uh, last week in the sermon on the judgments that there's five crowns. I'll mention them real quickly in the sermon today. I'm not going to preach on the five crowns at the judgment seat of Christ where we'll reign with Christ. What I'm going to preach on is your motive at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what I want to preach on this morning. But uh, the theme of 1 Corinthians, as we go through 1 Corinthians, you're going to hear me talk a lot about the judgment seat of Christ and when you face God at the judgment as a Christian for your works. Alright? I'm not talking... Salvation is free. Your inheritance is not. Do you understand that? Everything about your... In, there's some things that's free in the inheritance, but some things are earned rewards. Christians do earn rewards. There's things that you have to earn at the judgment seat of Christ. How do you do it? You do it by your good works. Say, preacher, do you believe in good works? Yes, I do. I think serving Christ, you serve Him by good works. I just don't think you do it to get saved. Salvation's a free gift. But you need works when you get to that judgment seat of Christ. Otherwise, you're going to be given an open shame. You got, you got a thousand year reign with Christ. Where we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You know some Christians with no works at all? They'll be saved. They'll get to the new heaven and the new earth. But they're not going to reign with Christ. They might be there, but what will they be? Maybe the janitor? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, the crown's not promised unless you work. The crown's not promised as a gift. That's something you earn. He says, if you suffer with me, you shall reign with me. If. You're not promised to reign just because you're saved. A lot of people think the, that the rain's a free gift. It's not. There is works involved. You ought to read the book of Titus and see how much it mentioned works. I mean, uh, the hyper-dispensationalist tries to get rid of the book of James practically, which deals with works. Okay? Faith without works is what? Vain? Or Dead? Spiritually, I like to say, well, a Christian without works, he's a deadbeat. <laughs> All right? Okay? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a real deal. We believe, we believe in works, which is not for salvation. But we do believe in works. You read Titus. Now, Titus is dealing with the church age saint and works. You, you go through there and underline every time it says works in the book of Titus. You tell me that's not for church age saint. That's Pauline all the way. 
Okay? For the guys that are hyper, -dis I call them hyper dispensationalists. They try to rob you from certain areas of the Word of God to practically apply it to you. And uh, so, and our third service will go into that a little bit more in the book of James. The well, riches of good works. Then we are rich in faith. I got to get through this riches, uh, verse 5 here. Uh, rich in faith. Look at James chapter 2. Here's one out, James. James chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which He have promised to them that love Him? Uh, now, let's put this practical to us today. You know what the problem with our riches is today? If I need something... I just put it on the charge card. You wait till you get to the position where the charge card ain't going to help you out. Yeah. Then you need something and you have to sit there and get down and say, Lord, You said You'd provide if I needed anything. This is a need. And I can't buy this need. And the Lord says, Will you believe I can provide? Lord, I know you can provide it. It's taken care of. Rich in faith. You know what helps you grow in your faith? When you can't put it on the charge card. When you can't put it in the charge. The poor usually wind up being stronger in the faith than the rich. Why? Because the rich never depend on God. They depend on their wallet. They depend on money. That, that's why Americans are probably some of the most carnal Christians that, the, that has ever been through the church history. We're too rich. We're too rich. You, they say, uh, how many of you ever said, I want to see revival in America? I'd like to see revival. The problem is, I know what comes with revival. Last time you had a great revival in America was in the Great Depression. Or in time of war. Either war or poverty brings revival. Right now, people are getting saved left and right in the Ukraine. My brother-in-law is a missionary in Ukraine. They go over to Ukraine. When they go to them villages that's been bombed, He's getting 50 to 100 people saved every time he goes out preaching in those areas that have been. But boy, what did it take to make them tender enough to seek God? You want revival in America? Things have to change. Yeah, this country has to be broken down enough where we'll actually seek God. Nobody's seeking God right now. Too rich. We're too rich. You, know, you study the seven churches, the ones that were on fire for God were the poor ones that had nothing, and the one that had need of nothing was Laodicea. They're rich, but not toward God. Not toward God. Riches, and we, we just covered that with Laodicea. I'm going to skip that one, but... You want to be rich toward God. Physical riches don't bring it. Uh, being rich toward God is uh, comes during suffering. Uh, well, let's let's uh, let's take and hit one more verse. Go to Revelation chapter two. I got to close here. Revelation chapter two, verse nine. Let me give it to you. I'll give you these verses. Let's read it. Let's read it. I'm not just going to mention it. Let's read it. Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 9. Revelation 2, 9. I know thy works in tribulation and what? There it is. Poverty. There's the physical riches. Now here's the spiritual riches. But thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, 
and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, here's a guy, here's a group. They're rich, but physically they're poor. Why? Because they're rich spiritually. Now look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now here's another church. Here's another church. Church of Laodicea. It says, um, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. There's America. And notice not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I, that fire is the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it passes through the fire without being burned. Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now you see there, the works that don't go through the judgment seat of Christ will cause you shame. There will be some Christians that will have shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because they have no works. Now, you know what the linen in Revelation is a liken that the bride wears? It's the righteousness of the saints. It's their righteousness. Now that's not... False righteousness, like the Pharisees had. That's true righteousness. Okay? It's likened to clothing that covers their shame. Covers them. Okay? Uh, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke, Chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Alright, so there's your riches. Your spiritual riches and your physical riches. Uh, Christian, the riches of this world isn't going to amount to hill of beans. Uh, I will. Hang on, i got to give you one more verse. i got to give you one more. i got to give you one more here. Alright. Now, th this one will top off the lesson well. Uh, I just, I, I know I wrote this one down. Philippians 3.8. Go Philippians 3.8. Alright. Here it is. Now th this will sink the lesson in. Okay. Paul's opinion on the riches of this world and everything he gave up for Christ. Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Yea, doubtless I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do, and do count them but what? Dumb, that I may win Christ. You know what the riches of this world is? Something that belongs in the septic tank in comparison to the riches of Christ. Boy, it's hard for us to look at it that way, but as Christians, that's the way we need to view it. That's the way we need to view it. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's take a break.